Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the USMLE guys. My name is Dr. Paul. In today's lecture, we are going to be going over some high yield MSK pathology. Now this lecture was taken right out of our step one high yield crash course. So if you enjoy it, you like the way we ask questions, we go over the information, check out the link below or in the description below, you can learn about the entire crash course on our website. Now, if this is your first time here, I wanna welcome you. If, you've, if you're returning, I wanna welcome you back. But if it is your first time, hit that subscribe button below and set up notifications and I will let you know every time we release brand new videos. And if you enjoy this, you find it to be useful, all I ask is that you hit that thumbs up button below. All right, let's not waste any more time. Let's dive in with today's episode. All right, welcome back to the next lecture. Let's dive in with our first question. Go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, the correct answer here is E. So let's talk about lupus, which is, of course, a systemic remitting and relapsing autoimmune disease that causes organ damage as a result of mainly type 3 hypersensitivity reactions. So in SLE, a deficiency of early complement proteins leads to a decrease in the clearance of immune complexes. Classically, we've got a wide range of findings uh, that are overlapping and, and can be confusing, but we can remember them with the mnemonic rash or pain. So let me go walk you through what this mnemonic is. So rash or pain. R, rash, stands for rash. This is typically described as discoid or malar. A is for arthritis. It is non-erosive arthritis. S is for serositis. H is for hematologic disorders. O is for oral or nasopharyngeal ulcers that are usually painless. R is for renal disease. P is for photosensitivity. A is for anti-nuclear antibodies. I represents immunologic disorder. Now this refers to anti-double-stranded DNA, anti-Smith, and anti-phospholipid antibodies. And the N represents neurologic disorders. That can include things like psychosis or even seizures. Now let's look at some of the specific issues that we need to know when it comes to SLE, starting first with the heart. So the main concern on the heart is the development of a type of endocarditis known as Lehman Sachs endocarditis, whereby thrombi develop on the mitral or the aortic valve, most likely on the undersurface. And these are, of course, non-bacterial in nature. Now, in the kidney, what you want to watch out for is lupus nephritis. This can be nephritis, or rather, this could be nephritic, or it could be nephrotic, with the most common and severe type being the diffuse proliferative type. In this condition, we see glomerular deposition of DNA, anti-DNA immune complexes. Now, in pregnant patients, we need to worry about something called neonatal lupus. This carries the greatest risk when the patient is anti-SSA positive. Now, this is worrisome because it can lead to congenital heart block, rash, uh, transaminitis, and cytopenias at birth. Some of the common causes of death that you need to remember associated with SLE will include things like infections, an accelerated rate of CAD, and the most common cause is renal disease. Now, there's also a condition known as mixed connective tissue disease. This has features of SLE, meaning based on the descriptions in a vignette, you're starting to think SLE. The writers want you to start thinking SLE, but it's also characterized by systemic sclerosis and polymyositis. Now, do you know which specific antibody is present in mixed connective tissue disease? Well, if you said anti-U1 RNA, excellent job. Now, another condition I want, you, I want to review here with you before we move on is the antiphospholipid syndrome. Now, this is an autoimmune disorder that's characterized by blood clots, miscarriages, rash, chronic headaches, seizure, and dementia. Now, this is oftentimes seen in those who have SLE. And one of the often tested concepts that you need to remember about this syndrome is that the anticardiolipin antibodies, which are seen in those with this condition, can cause a false positive VDRL and RPR. Other lab findings that you should watch out for here are the presence of lupus anticoagulant, uh, anticardiolipin, and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibodies. Now, the lupus anticoagulant has the ability to cause PTT prolongation that doesn't get corrected when platelet-free plasma is added. And so that's something that they could definitely throw in there sort of as an aside. And if you know it, you know it. If you don't, you're probably not even going to think twice about why they told you that. All right, let's move on. Let's do a matching question. Go ahead and hit the pause button. Uh, try and figure this one out and then come on back when you think you've got everything correct. All 
All right, here are your correct answers. If you need to fix anything, hit that pause button, go ahead and do so. Otherwise, let's take a look at the conditions from this exercise. Let's start with polymyalgia rheumatica. Now, this condition is characterized by pain and stiffness in proximal muscles, and it's often accompanied by things like fever, malaise, and weight loss. Now, it's important to note that muscle weakness is not associated with this condition, but it is associated with another condition known as giant cell arteritis. Now, as you might have guessed from this question, this is most commonly seen in females who are older than 50 years of age. Hopefully, you got that right when you were matching. Now, the labs in this condition are going to demonstrate an increase in ESR as well as an increase in CRP, but creatine kinase will be normal. Now, this will typically respond well to low-dose corticosteroids. The second condition here is fibromyalgia. This is seen most commonly in females between 20 and 50 years of age, and this is characterized by widespread musculoskeletal pain, stiffness, paresthesias, fatigue, as well as cognitive disturbances. Those cognitive disturbances are known as fibro fog. Now, this is best managed with regular exercise, the use of antidepressants, and if needed, pain medicine directed at the nerves. So a drug like gabapentin would be ideal here. Next up is polymyositis and dermatomyositis. Now, pertaining to both of these, nonspecific lab findings would include things like increased CK and positive antinuclear antibodies, while specific findings would be a positive anti-JO1, anti-SRP, and anti-MI2 antibodies. A polymyositis is a condition characterized by proximal muscle weakness that is progressing, and this is due to endomesial inflammation with CD8 T cells. Now, the most likely place you're going to see this is in the shoulders. And so I want you to think of um, activities of daily living that would require the shoulders, like combing the hair, brushing the teeth, putting away the dishes. Um, oftentimes, they'll give you that in a vignette, and that's something that should really spark your, um, your mind to think polymyositis. Now, dermatomyositis is clinically similar to this, but it also includes the presence of gotron papules, uh, facial erythema in a photodistributed manner, so wherever you would see uh, the sun hitting the face, a rash on the face, as well as darkening and thickening of the fingertips and sides, resulting in irregular appearing marks. Now, this condition is associated with an increased risk of occult malignancy. And finally, we have myositis ossificans. This is a benign condition characterized by heterotropic ossification that involves the skeletal muscles and is associated with blunt muscle trauma. Now, this is going to be identifiable by the presence of a soft tissue mass and, on imaging, the presence of eggshell calcifications. On histology, I want you to be on the lookout for metaplastic bone surrounding areas of fibroblastic proliferation. All right, let's move on to the next question. Now, just as a side note, depending on which version of the first aid you're using, at this point, you may or may not see vasculitis in your book. Uh, some older versions of the first aid um, do this in cardio, some don't, but more recent versions, uh, it's in the MSK section. We're going to leave it in the cardio section and skip them here because there's no sense in doing something the exact same twice. So you can check that out in the cardio section. Uh, for now though, we're gonna skip that. But if you're looking at it in your first aid, don't worry, we're going to cover this in uh, cardio. So you will um, be alerted as to when and where that will show up. All right, all right, next question is a matching exercise. You're gonna match the features of myasthenia gravis and Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. So go ahead and hit that pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answers. All right, so myasthenia gravis and Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome are high yield and commonly tested. So let's make sure that we know everything that we need to know about these so that we can secure ourselves a couple easy points on exam day. So first, keep in mind that myasthenia gravis, I'm just going to refer to that as MG, is the most common neuromuscular junction disorder and that Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome is rather uncommon. So based just on knowing that, be sure that if in a vignette you're starting to think about one of these, you always remember myasthenia gravis is more common. They're more likely to test me on more common things. Just keep that in mind, especially if you come down and you can't figure it out, or if you just forget, but hopefully you don't do that. Now, the underlying pathology in MG is going to be what? It's the presence of autoantibodies to postsynaptic ACH receptors. The difference between MG and Lambert-Eaton is that in Lambert-Eaton, we've got antibodies to the presynaptic calcium channels. That's going to result in a drop of acetylcholine release. 
So Mycenae gravis is autoantibodies against postsynaptic ACH receptors, Lambert Eaton, presynaptic autoantibodies against calcium channels, lowering the drop or dropping or lowering the release of ACH. Now let's look at the findings we can expect to see in each. This is really where the vignette's information is going to point you one way or the other. So in Mycenae gravis, a couple things you want to look out for. Look out for fatigue, fatigable muscle weakness, uh, ptosis, uh, which is a big indicator, diplopia, proximal muscle weakness, respiratory muscles involved, and which would likely, likely uh, present as dyspnea in a vignette, as well as bulbar muscle involvement. That might present itself as trouble swallowing, difficulty speaking or chewing, and all of these things are going to worsen with the use of muscles. That's what we call fatigable. That's the fatigable, fatigable component I mentioned earlier. Now with myasthenia gravis, reflexes won't be effective. Now moving on to LE, this is characterized by proximal muscle weakness and autonomic symptoms like constipation, dry mouth, and impotence. Remember, in myasthenia gravis, we see no change in reflexes. Well, in LE, we tend to see hypo-lowered reflexes, hyporeflexia. Now another important distinguishing factor between MG and LE is that in MG, the problem worsens with muscle use. In Lambert-Eaton, it tends to improve with muscle use. So exact opposites. Another very important detail that's commonly tested on exam day is the associations with these two conditions. I could, if there's one thing that they're gonna test you on, I would bet my money that it's on this. So in Mycena gravis, an important association to remember is its relationship to the presence of a thymoma. In Lambert-Eaton, it's small cell lung cancer. And the final piece of the puzzle here is what happens when we administer an ACHE inhibitor? So in Mycena gravis, the administration of an ACHE inhibitor will reverse the symptoms. In Lambert-Eaton, it won't have any effect. Or if it has any effect, it's just very, very minimal. All right, make sure you know that stuff. All right, let's move on to the next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, the correct answer here is A. Let's talk about scleroderma. Now, this is a condition that causes sclerosis of the skin that results in very taut skin that looks puffy but is without wrinkles. Now, this is overwhelmingly more common in females. Now, this condition is characterized by three main processes, which include autoimmunity, non-inflammatory vasculopathy, and collagen deposition with fibrosis. Now, this condition also affects organ systems like the kidneys, the lungs, the GI tract, and the heart. If it affects the kidneys, we can get a scleroderma renal crisis. This absolutely needs to be managed with ACEIs, ACE inhibitors. Now, in the lungs, we'll see interstitial fibrosis and we'll see pulmonary hypertension. In the GI tract, we can see things like esophageal dysmotility as well as reflux. Now, keep in mind that there are two types. We have diffuse and limited. Diffuse scleroderma is widespread and it progresses rapidly with early visceral involvement. And there's two antibodies that you need to know here. The anti-SCL70 antibody and the anti-RNA polymerase 3 antibody. In the limited type, we've got limited skin involvement that's typically confined to both the face and the fingers. Now this is really where we're talking about Crest syndrome. Now Crest syndrome is characterized by calcinosis cutis, uh, the presence of an anti-centromere antibody, uh, renal phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia. That's Crest, the mnemonic. Now, don't forget about renal phenomenon, which occurs most commonly in the fingers. This condition can be both primary, which means it's idiopathic, and if that's the case, we will call this renal disease, or it can be secondary to another disease process. If that's the case, we then call it renal syndrome. Now, it can be secondary to a variety of disease processes, such as we recently talked about mixed connective tissue disease, Crest syndrome, and SLE. The underlying problem here is a drop in blood flow to the skin as a result of arterial or vasospasm in response to things like stress or cold. As a result, those fingertips and toes get white, which indicates ischemia, then change to blue, which indicates hypoxia, then return to red, which means reperfusion has set in. All right, let's do one more question before we end this lecture. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is D. Okay, so this is not anything too complicated. You need to know what this, that the skin has three layers. We have epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous fat. 
the layers of the epidermis are as follows, starting from superficial and moving down. Stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and stratum basalis. Make sure you refer to that picture in your books or Google it if you want to so that you can recognize these layers if given to you visually. One thing I might recommend is Googling the histology here so that you can make sure you identify what each one of these layers looks like because this is something that commonly pops up. Skin, very important organ, therefore very likely to be tested. This is a super easy anatomy slash histo or a combination type of question. That's the end of this lecture. I'll see you guys on the next one. All right, guys, that is it. I hope you found that to be helpful. If you did and you haven't yet hit that thumbs up button below, I would greatly appreciate it if you did so now. And like I said earlier, if you're not yet subscribed and you want me to let you know every time we release brand new lectures, drill sessions, or anything, make sure you hit that subscribe button below, set up notifications, and we will let you know every time we release a brand new lecture, drill session, coaching corner, etc. I appreciate you guys spending some time with me today. I do hope that was helpful. We'll see you on the next episode.